So the reason we're here is because there's been a massive interest in the role or the, the relationship between gut health and mental health. And that's illustrated by how quickly this lecture actually booked out. Uh, so, uh, and so what I'd like to talk to you today about is to firstly talk about how the mechanisms by which the gut might affect the brain and vice versa. Talk about a little bit about the evidence that that's involved in various diseases and then go on to uh, talk a little bit about how we might be use that information to treat various uh, health problems. So as I said, this is, the, this is obviously the, about the health, uh, a lecture about health. However, this illustration here is actually taken from management today. So this cartoon suggests that people in management should listen to their guts when making decisions. Now I hope by the end of today I'll convince you that this may not be a reliable method for making decisions because let, there's lots of other reasons why your might, gut might be complaining to you. Okay, so let's, let's start by looking at this. Now, obviously a big part of this, the, the way we think the gut might affect the brain involves the bacteria that are present, normally present in the gut called the gut's microbiota. And as, as we heard in the introduction, this is a, there is a, a really great exhibition on this currently uh, going on at the, just opened up this, this weekend at the Melbourne Museum. I strongly encourage you to go and look at this because it is really quite an amazing exhibition and it's, it's really fun for all ages. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why I think this sort of exhibition is so important at the end of the, the talk. So the term gut-brain axis has become very common. People talk about this, they talk about the fact that there's interaction between these two. Uh, two organs and the idea is that bacteria are responsible for talking, bacteria in the gut are responsible for talking to the brain and you'll see lots of, you'll be bombarded, you only need to go onto the internet for a short while before you'll be bombarded with ads for things that are going to make you feel better by uh, affecting the, the bacteria in your gut. So that's just, here's some of the, the, the headlines or ads you might see on the internet. But this brain gut axis does not just involve bacteria. It's important to realise that there, yes, there are, are kilograms worth of bacteria within your gut and that's normal, but there are lots of other ways that the brain and the gut communicate. In particular, there are a whole series of nerves that communicate between the gut and the brain. Those are the axons or the, the processes, the, the wires that carry electrical signals between the gut and the brain. And there are also a whole series of hormones. Those are chemical messengers that are re released into the bloodstream and those chemical messengers mediate interactions, both effects of the brain on the gut and the effects, uh, effects of the gut on the brain as well, as we'll see. But there of course are, there's lots of information now suggesting that bacteria in our, our gut produce things, produce molecules which affect our brains and affect our mental state, our behaviour. And that's really an exciting new aspect to this. So first of all, it's important to remember that your gut is an intelligent organ. There are as many neurons in the gastrointestinal tract as there are in the spinal cord. And say, for instance, if you compare the numbers of neurons, that is nerve cells in your gut, there's more neurons in your gut than there are in the mouse cerebral cortex. So your gut has more neurons than a mouse's brain. And this, this is a very complex nervous system and we're still, starting, uh, still trying to understand this fully, but it has a system to understand what's going on, a system to process information and systems to have effects, but mainly on your gastrointestinal system. And it responds to lots of stimuli that might be going on in your gastrointestinal tract. But there are also, as I said, nerves which connect your gut to your brain. And those in, uh, are, there's some very large nerves. There's one here called the vagus nerve, which is very important. It comes down from the brain stem and connects to various parts of your, your gastrointestinal tract and also almost all your other organs. There are nerves, which are called the splanking nerves, that come out from the spinal cord that also send information to the gut and control the gut's function. 
But at the same time, there are also many sensory nerves that detect what's going on within the gastrointestinal tract and send that information to your brain and your nervous system. Now, this isn't something that you would really be aware of from moment to moment. In fact, most of that information never reaches your consciousness. But it is used by your nervous system to control the gut, to react to what's going on in the gut. And this is quite fascinating if you think about it. The idea that, there's, that what's going in your body is reaching your brain, you're just not conscious of it. Okay. So that's a, a quite powerful concept to think about. And also, as I said, there are hormones that make these connections. So if we try to understand how your gut might affect your emotions, we first need to start by thinking about what is an emotion. And this is something that scientists do. They like to define things. Uh, so you might just, you, you accept you have emotions, but what's happening in your body when you have emotions is quite fascinating. And scientists have tried to define emotions and it's quite hard. So here's an example of one emotion, one, pardon me, one definition of emotions, which is published in 1992, which is fairly well accepted. Uh, I won't make you read that whole definition there, but basically to summarise, emotions involve feelings that we know come from your brain, that are, that are reactions to things you see or that you think, but it also intrinsically involves reactions in your body. And we call those autonomic reactions because they are controlled by those nerves that innovate or send processes out to and control your organs. So this is really something, if you think about it, which is integral to an emotion. Emotions affect your physiology. They affect the function of your body by definition. And indeed, if uh, we, we know that what's going on in your body can ramp up or augment those emotions you're feeling. There's lots of evidence for that, mainly done in humans back when we could do things to humans uh, without uh, so much ethical control, but they are, they are they're sort of still fascinating experiments. So those cognitive aspects are controlled by a part of your brain called the limbic system, which we know is part and parcel, or in, particularly involved in mental health issues. And the reactions in your body are controlled by those, that autonomic nervous system, the nerves that I showed you that control your organs. And so we know that when you have an emotion, you have lots of things happening in your body. We know there's effects on your blood pressure, there's effects on your heart rate, respiration. So if you're excited, of course, you start to breathe faster, things like that. But there are also effects on hormones associated with emotions, and there are also effects on your gastrointestinal tract, as we'll see. And the whole, the reason for this is one, to communicate to others what you're, you're feeling, but also to prepare you to respond to whatever it is that's generated that emotion. Okay, and it's that these processes are coordinated, those body function changes are coordinated by an area called the, hip, the hypothalamus, which is found in the, the, the base of the brain. So as I said, our emotions affect our gut. There are lots of examples of this. Obviously, if you're rather stressed, about to give a lecture or something like that, you might be a bit tense. And then you, you might see that you, have, uh, you might have what's called stress-induced diarrhea. So that is something that is that most of us who've been a very, in a very stressful situation might have experienced. So this leads to, we know this is an effect of, on your brain, of, of your brain on your gut because stress uh, you know, I, I know about this lecture because my brain tells me that it's going to happen. So this is not something that my gut is effect, is effect my gut is having on my brain. This is an effect my brain is having on the gut. We know that's a quite powerful effect. If depending on how, uh, how bad the stress is, it can lead to uh, watery diarrhea, uh, pain and cramping. So this is something which is, is, uh, is a strong effect. Now we'll also, uh, if you're a human being and you've experienced stress, then you will know that there are effects of stress on your stomach and your gastric function. And you tend to feel, if you're stressed, you tend to feel your stomach is more acidic. Okay, so that's something which is, we, people, you will observe. I, I, I certainly, I, I have had that experience. Certainly, I think most people in the room will have. But the science suggests that that's not actually what's happening. You're not, when you're stressed, you're not increasing acid secretion in your stomach, acid being the stuff which helps you helps with digestion. Uh, 
in your stomach, but you are increasing your sensitivity to what's happening in your stomach. If you're stressed, you can also really shut down your gut, which means that things tend to sit in your stomach and that can lead to gastric reflux as well. So we think the stress has effects on the protective mechanisms in your gut and that's why people who have uh, uh, chronic stress can have gastric problems including gastric reflux disease but also are more likely to get gastric ulcers. And for a long time, of course, it was thought that stress was the cause of gastric ulcers. Turns out that's not the case. We've known that for quite a while now, but it was a set of Australians who proved this. If anyone hasn't heard of these guys, you should have. Robin Warren and Barry Marshall were Australians who showed that stomach ulcers were not caused by stress. They were caused by bacterium. So this was a bacterium called Halicobacter pylori, which likes to live in this acid of your stomach and stimulates acid and causes overproduction of acid. So in, people didn't believe this for a long time until uh, Barry Marshall um, infected himself with the bacterium to show that it caused gastric ulcers. Okay, so we know that bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract can cause problems locally in your gut. And that's an example here of, of uh, an EM picture, that's an electron microscope picture of the, uh, the bacteria that cause gastric ulcers. So then, that's, that's well accepted. Are there any other diseases that bacteria in your gut or bad bacteria, so-called bac bacteria, might cause? Well, first of all, we need to think about how bacteria in your gut might affect your other organs and, and particularly your brain. So if we look at brain diseases in general, we see that almost all of them are associated with gastrointestinal side effects, gastrointestinal symptoms. So in Parkinson's disease, it's very, very common for people to have constipation. In our lab, we're working on exactly why that is. It looks at quite to be quite fascinating, it turns out that the neurotransmitters that are involved in Parkinson's disease and are not working, that's the, the messengers that send signals between neurons, uh, may be also involved in controlling the gut. But uh, there are lots of other examples of brain diseases where there are gastrointestinal symptoms associated with them that we don't know what the mechanism is. That includes uh, multiple sclerosis, which is involved with constipation, Huntington's disease, which is a, another nasty brain disease, which causes problems swallowing and incontinence and constipation, autism. PTSD is a very interesting one, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a disorder that we see most commonly in returned servicemen who've been in war zones, and uh, they, they tend to have an increased incidence of what we call inflammatory bowel disease. Schizophrenia is, very, is associated with IBD as well, but it's also associated with another nasty condition of the gut called uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which is not, does not involve overt inflammation. Uh, and also anxiety and depression are associated with abdominal pain and uh, inf uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Now, so when we look, people have been interested as to why this is. Why is this this strong connection between brain disease and gastrointestinal symptoms? If you look at the bacteria that are present in people, in the guts of people who have these diseases, you find that they all have changes. Changes in the gut microbiome. That is the, the, the variety and the numbers of particular types of bacteria. And we're very good these days at measuring that and looking at the, the, the range of bacteria that are present in a person's gut, particularly if you can get a, a sample from, uh, from faeces, but also we, we take samples uh, using an endoscope as well. And it, again, if you go to the, uh, the museum, you'll see one of the machines that's used there to do this sort of analysis. So all of these diseases have been associated with changes in the bacteria in the gut which raises the question, is that part of the disease? Is that contributing to the disease? 
Well, I'm going to concentrate mostly in this talk on anxiety, depression and also post-traumatic stress disorder. But there is work going on to understand that and, and ask that question in all of these diseases. The main question here is one of causation. What causes the problem? What came first, the dysbiosis, that is the problem with, with gut bacteria, or the brain disease? And how might bacteria, bad bacteria, affect the brain? It's not immediately obvious if you think about it. But it is obvious that if you have a problem with your brain, you have a problem with your behaviour, that that might affect your gut. And you can think about some fairly simple ways that that might happen. If your nervous system isn't working, if you're depressed, if you have, uh, that can cause problems with the nerves that control your organs, it can cause problems with your hormones, it can problems, cause problems with diet. Okay, so people that are depressed don't tend to eat very well. And that can lead to gut dysfunction and that could have an effect on the bacteria in your gut. Okay, so that is a complicating factor when we're trying to understand this, we have to understand that there are lots of things that affect the bacteria in people's guts. We don't, people are not lab rats where we can fully control everything. This is quite, this is quite a hard question to answer. But equally, we also know very strongly now that bacteria in your gut produce things. They produce molecules which can enter your bloodstream, travel to your brain and affect your behaviour. There are lots of examples of this coming out of the literature now. So when we think about this, it's important to understand that the bacteria that are in your gut are not actually within your body, at least not within your body tissues. So we put lots of different things into our mouths, a whole array of different things which are not particularly very good for us, that if you were to inject them into your bloodstream would kill you. So in fact your gut is very good at keeping things that you put into your mouth out of the tissues in your body. So you, you can really see yourself as a donut here. Your gut is a, a hole that goes from one end to the other and just because you put food in your mouth doesn't mean it's going to enter your bloodstream. Okay, so we have, we have a process of ingestion where you take food into your gut, we have excretion at the end and we have a much more selective process which we call absorption where things are taken out of your food and enter your bloodstream. And there are lots of bacterial products that we know are taken up from the gut into your body, and those include vitamins, so very important vitamins which are produced by bacteria in your gut. Those are things like vitamin K and B1 and B12. But there are also other molecules like modified amino acids. Now, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and so you need to take those, you need to absorb them from, from your food. Some of those amino acids are modified by bacteria and can go into your bloodstream and affect your brain. There are also various fatty molecules, molecules that uh, like to be in, in an oily environment, a fatty environment, not in water, and those tend to cross the cell membranes in your gut and get into your bloodstream more easily. So there are bacterial products that go into your, your body from your gut, but it's only a, a very select type of molecule and a small number of molecules. Okay, so it's not like everything that bacteria produce in your gut gets to your brain. But there are, as I said, really good examples of this happening. I'll just uh, touch on one here which I th is uh, quite fascinating. So it's been suggested that if you have a, a ketogenic diet, that is a diet which is high in fats and proteins and low in carbohydrates, that that can have effects on your brain and it can actually be therapeutic in people with epilepsy. Now people with epilepsy of course have a condition where their brain cells fire off uh, and are activated too easily. They're, we call that an, an increase in excitability. So that's a very basic explanation of epilepsy uh, for our purposes today. But so it's been shown that if you, in laboratory animals, if you feed them a, a, a ketogenic diet, then that causes the release of metabolites and a particular metabolite called, uh, which is a modified amino acid, which then travels to the brain and reduces seizure activity in animals that are prone to epilepsy. So that, that, process, is, that process has been well defined and studied 
and there's good evidence that this occurs. The bacteria that like your uh, a diet, a ketogenic diet, produce this uh, stuff which affects your brain and can be useful in treating epilepsy. That's, that's lab rats. So in humans, there's some evidence that a ketogenic diet can improve some symptoms in some cases. So it's not as easy as it seems to translate this into humans, but certainly this is being used in the clinic, um, but it needs to be done in, under strict supervision because of course a ketogenic diet is rather an extreme diet, particularly in children. Okay, so it is, there is evidence that this works. And the idea is that perhaps good bacteria produce molecules which can dampen down the excitability of your brain. And so keep that in your mind because that actually relates to some of the other things I might be talking about. Okay, so there are specific molecules released by bacteria which travel to your brain. However, there's another way that molecules that bacteria produce can get to your brain. So as I said, there is a barrier. There's a mucosa, an epithelium, which is a layer of cells which have tight connections between, uh, between each other and stop things getting into your tissues. So that's normally, uh, that's why things in your gut need to be broken down before you can absorb them. However, if that bacterial barrier gets damaged in some way, then we have all hell breaking loose. There are lots of things which can then enter your body from bacteria, even normal bacteria, under those circumstances might release things into your bloodstream which could be uh, bad for you. So if that barrier is damaged, it's, it could be drastic. So we need to understand how that happens, why, and we really do need to try and prevent it. So the extreme case of damage to that barrier in your gut is called inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a very nasty disease which we're where currently we have very few treatments for that we're trying to better understand, better treat. There are two main types, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I'm going to talk most about Crohn's disease, which mainly affects the small intestine. So we, there's lots of evidence that this, uh, this very drastic inflammatory uh, reaction, and here's a, here's, this should be nice and pink and, uh, and even, this is the, the inside of somebody's gut looked at via an endoscope and you can see there are these nasty red inflammatory lesions which are going to, we know, cause the gut to be leaky. Okay. So we know that in, in humans with this sort of condition that their gut becomes leaky in various ways. So we know that bacteria have a role to play in generating inflammatory bowel disease and that's because uh, we, can, we can look at animals that don't have any bacteria in their gut and they're quite hard to generate, but we can do that. We can also look at, at humans that have inflammatory bowel disease and for some reason they've had the faecal stream diverted. That is, they've had to have an operation because their, their gut is so inflamed to connect their gut somewhere else so that you take away the stream of bacteria from that piece of gut which is inflamed. And if you do that, then the gut gets better until of course you reconnect the gut uh, when things get worse again. We also know that inflammatory bowel disease is treated with antibiotics, it's treated with anti-inflammatory diseases, although these are not cures and they have lots of side effects. And in many cases, people with disease, this disease require surgery. So 70% of people with Crohn's disease will require surgery at some point, and uh, one third of these will require surgery within five years of diagnosis, and that's despite everything we know about the way inflammation works and how to control it. So we've got lots of very, very expensive new drugs that control inflammation, and yet we're not reducing uh, drastically the number of people who go on to need surgery who have this disease. Um, and surgery is not a cure. After one year, eight out of 10 patients have developed some signs of recurrence of the disease, and one in 10 will require further surgery. So this is a nasty disease, and it needs, it needs to be better treated. So to understand this process, we need to understand what is inflammation. Well, just very briefly, inflammation is a reaction of the immune system to something that it doesn't like. And in general, inflammation is mostly involves what we call the innate immune system. It doesn't involve so much antibodies, it, but it, uh, which it, it's, a, it's a process which is always on, always there. 
It doesn't need to, you don't need to be exposed to a, a pathogen for it to be activated. That's what we call the innate immune response. And we think inflammation is involved in a whole range of diseases. And we know that, in, that, that acute inflammation is useful. Okay, so that it, it's useful, it prevents infections, and it is helpful. But if it becomes chronic, it becomes unhelpful, and as I said, leads to a whole range of diseases. There's a list of them there. Um, everything from rheumatoid arthritis and asthma to chronic pain and inflammatory bowel disease. So understanding why this occurs and how it affects the gut is going to be important. But what I'm going to talk to you today, of course, about is how the gut is central to this process, perhaps. Now, we also know that inflammation is implicated in a whole range of uh, mental, mental illnesses and brain diseases. For instance, things like depression and anxiety, as we'll see. So, if bacteria, particularly in inflammatory bowel disease, cause inflammation, why does this happen when bacteria are normal in our gut? Well, there are, as I said, there are a few different ways this might occur. The first I've talked to you about already, that the mucosal barrier might be compromised for some reason. Certainly if that occurs, then there will be a big reaction of the body, an inflammatory reaction. We, we've been studying that. Um, but also it may be that the immune system is abnormally active or sensitised. And we know that there are certain uh, genetic diseases which are associated with inflammatory bowel disease, which are changes in this sensitivity of lead to changes in the sensitivity of the immune system. So the immune system changes there can precipitate or, or predispose you to uh, inflammation in your gut. It's also possible that people get the right bacteria in the wrong places, and we'll look at that in a second. But once this inflammation occurs, the body's defense mechanisms actually can damage the body's tissues and you get a nasty vicious cycle whereby you get more inflammation and more damage to that mucosal barrier, which is uh, we think is what's happening. So I, I said we might get bacteria, the right bacteria in the wrong place. This is a, a little bit uh, controversial, but it's certainly something we need to consider. And that is that most of the bacteria in your gut are found within your large intestine. There are relatively few bacteria in the small intestine. Food comes through from your stomach, through your small intestine, to your large intestine. And there's a valve here between the small intestine, and that's illustrated here. Okay, so here's our small intestine, here's our large intestine, and between them there's a valve here called the ileocecal valve. So this valve is quite important for preventing bacteria which normally live in the large intestine from getting into the small intestine. Now, this sphincter is the area which is almost always removed in people who have surgery for Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease, you will read, is a disease that can occur anywhere in the body. However, the surgeons who work on people with Crohn's disease will tell you, almost always when somebody has surgery to remove a part of the gut, the first time around, it will be this part of the gut. So this is where, this is the hot, a hot spot for inflammatory bowel disease, particularly in Crohn's disease. Now, in laboratory mice, if you remove this sphincter, it doesn't have much effect unless the mice have some other insult or something else which causes them to react more to bacteria. Now in horses, it's well known that this sphincter goes wrong in various, uh, various uh, in colic uh, and is a big problem in horses. So this disease of this sphincter causes problems in horses in particular. We don't know how much the problems of this sphincter cause, uh, uh, cause disease in humans. In fact, we know very little about the biology of this sphincter and how it's controlled by nerves and how it might be impacted by changes in the nervous system. But we do know, as I said, that in a lot of people with Crohn's disease, this uh, this sphincter is affected, and you can imagine if you are not stopping bacteria getting from the large intestine to the small intestine, that might cause disease. So this is an, uh, an active area of research, um, and there's a lot of theories about this, but not much evidence. What we do know, however, is that gut bacteria do determine, to a large extent, the uh, the um, how uh, the reaction of the body to 
uh, to the surgery after in inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so this has been quite carefully studied by one of our colleagues at the Austin Hospital, who's shown that people who require surgery for Crohn's disease have different bacteria in their guts than people that don't. And indeed, if you sample the gut bacteria at the time of the surgery, you can pretty much predict whether that person is going to recur quickly. Okay, so it looks like the presence of particular bacteria within the gut of these patients correlates very strongly with the outcomes, disease outcomes. And indeed, you can go in with, a, with a, uh, an endoscope and you can sample a bacteria either side of the, that valve in these patients and you will find that there are, there are um, bacteria from this large intestine appear to be getting into the small intestine in these patients. So, how are we going to treat this nasty disease? So here we come to a, a major focus of my research at the moment and the, the clinical trial that we're, we uh, hope to start later in this year. So remember I said to you that the, um, the nervous system controls the gut. Turns out that this vagus nerve, which innervates the gut, has a big effect on the immune system and it can turn down inflammation. So by electrically stimulating the vagus nerve, we hope to inhibit inflammation in people with Crohn's disease. Now putting a stimulator into a person is a rather drastic thing to do, but I hope I've convinced you that this disease is a drastic disease. It requires surgery, but these people are having surgery already to have a part of the bowel removed. So we hope to try this in people who are requiring surgery. Now this has been attempted previously in a very small study. And in that study, the vagus nerve was stimulated up in the neck here. So this is a nerve which goes down from the brain to the gut. What we're hoping to do is stimulate this nerve further down, closer to the organs. And what that means is we avoid all of the problems that this uh, created because this nerve actually controls the heart and the lungs as well, or it can, uh, has effects on respiration. So this is, uh, we're, we're currently working on uh, uh, designing an implant and so this is a, a big part of the exciting part of my job we have we have clinicians we have uh, bioengineers we have surgeons practicing the surgery um, and the interesting thing about this trial is unlike uh, most clinical trials which generally have a company behind them this trial is fully funded by government sources okay so this is this is uh, really uh, quite interesting uh, approach to try to get new treatments uh, into the clinic. So we're quite, we're quite interested to see whether this inflammation, this decrease in inflammation might, that we hope it will occur in these patients, will be associated with normalisation of the microbiota. But that's, that's something that's research in progress. We're going to sample the bacteria in the gut and see what effect uh, stimulating this nerve has. But in our experiments in animals, we've shown that this this vagus nerve stimulation has a very powerful effect on inhibiting inflammation. So this is a, this is a biopsy of gut in an animal which has had an inflammatory stimulus. And you can see that uh, when the gut becomes inflamed, these dots here are immune cells. And those immune cells have reached the, the outer layers of the gut here where they're not normally present. So we normally have lots of immune cells in the mucosa but having immune cells out here in the outer layers of the gut is very abnormal and it's a feature of Crohn's disease and it is a feature which is indicative of very bad disease. And we can almost completely inhibit that, those, uh, those um, immune cells from entering that part of the gut when we stimulate the vagus nerve. So that's looking very promising. Um, so this illustrates that bad bacteria cause inflammation and the brain or the immune system can control inflammation. So we're using this red arrow here. We're trying to stimulate the nerves that control inflammation to treat inflammatory bowel disease. But of course we need to consider that the inflammation caused by these bacteria may also affect the brain. What is the evidence for that and what is the evidence that that's involved in CNS disorders? So in humans, people have done a lot of work trying to study inflammation. 
And it's very clear that there is inflammation in patients who have uh, CNS disorders, particularly depression has been looked at very closely. So there is inflammation within the brain and within the bloodstream in people who are depressed, particularly people who have a major depression. Now we also know that there's evidence that inflammation in the body can affect the brain and actually cause depression. So if you have a heart attack, you damage your heart muscle. And one of the things that happens very quickly is that your blood is filled with inflammatory molecules, signaling molecules that cause inflammation and activate the inflammatory part of the immune system. And that is correlated with depression. So people who have a heart attack, about 30% of them will have major depression after having a heart attack. We think that's how the two are related. We also know that there's an increase in inflammatory molecules within the bloodstream in people who have depression. And it's been suggested that anti-inflammatory molecules, so if you, you, you attack the inflammation using drugs, that that can have benefits in people with depression. Uh, it's not a very big effect, but it certainly is there. Um, so is it possible that the inflammation that may be caused by poor gut health could be contributing to depression and mental illness? Well, we know that there are other links between the mental illness and, the, and uh, gut disease, and particularly that occurs in people with, uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. So the most common form of a stress disorder is what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. It's seen, as I said, in, uh, in soldiers in combat situations. The longer soldiers spend in a situation where they're fearful for their lives, and this can be months to years, the more likely they are to develop a, this condition called PTSD. It turns out that veterans have a much higher rate of inflammatory bowel disease, which is why uh, in part, the Department of Defence in the US is funding our research to try and treat that disease. But we also know that people have IBD suffer from PTSD at very high rates. So it's been estimated about 30% of people with PTSD, uh, sorry, with inflammatory bowel disease, have symptoms of PTSD. And it's been suggested this might be because the disease itself is so traumatic. But again, we don't know why this is. There is certainly a, a uh, connection. Now we know that stress is controlled, stress responses are controlled by the body, by the brain and a particular part of the brain called the HPA axis, the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in humans and we know that there is evidence that bacteria in your gut can affect this axis. How does this occur? Well just very briefly Stress disorders are generally associated with abnormal responses to a stress. So spiders are stressful, jumping out of a plane is stressful, um, remembering or thinking about certain things that have happened to you can be stressful. But people who have stress disorders have an abnormally high stress response to those things and that's what we think underlies things like PTSD but also anxiety disorders. And we think this is due to an overactivity of the brain under those circumstances. So in a stress response, we get activation of the brain, which then connects to, leads to a cascade of events and releases hormones from the brain, which then control other, um, other hormone release. In this case, a stress hormone called cortisol, which is released from the adrenal gland. This activates those physiological responses we feel when we're stressed, that is increases uh, uh, in uh, various, various body functions. And we know that chronic stress is, is bad for you, it does lots of different things, but we also know that severe prolonged stress can damage the brain and this is what we think is happening in PTSD, particularly in uh, veterans who have such severe stress for such long periods. So, there's evidence that bacteria can affect the brain. There's evidence that the brain can affect the gut. But why do people have bad bacteria in their guts? Well, this could be due to infection. There's a nasty bacterium called uh, Clostridium difficile, which is seen in people who have 
uh, ongoing gut problems. That's a very nasty infection. It's not that common, but it is due to an infection. We also know that overuse of antibiotics can change the bacteria in your gut and that can have effects on your health. But particularly we know that poor diet is associated with problems with your gut flora, the bacteria in your gut. And indeed, so bacteria in your gut need fibre. Western diets are notoriously low in fibre and, uh, high, and, and low in complex carbohydrates, which bacteria in your large intestine need to be healthy. And when we look at people who have healthy gut and we look at their, their, uh, their diet, we find that they tend to eat a large variety of fruits and vegetables and that gives them a diverse range of bacteria in the gut. So really diversity of different types of bacteria in the gut are healthy. And that um, we also know that people who eat large amounts of pre-processed food and packaged food also have increases in bad bacteria and dysbiosis. And why this, this is, is an interesting question, uh, but, but the take home message here is that you create an environment in your gut with your diet. And certainly, recently, we know that there's been a huge, massive increase in sugar intake in the population. We're up to about, I think the latest figures are 50 kilograms per person per year in Australia, which is a huge amount of sugar. Now, you will read things on the internet saying that there is not, there's no evidence that a high sugar diet affects the bacteria in your gut. And that's true, because we haven't really studied this well enough. Okay, so this, the jury is still out about how a high sugar diet affects the bacteria in your gut. But it's certainly true that people who have a high sugar diet tend to have low fibre diet. Okay? There's lots of evidence that this, this huge intake of sugar is bad for you. We can argue about why, but it's bad for you. Okay, so that's a take home message there. So can we treat diseases by manipulating the bacteria in the gut? That's really the, ta that's the crux of this here, isn't it? If we think bacteria are important for health and bad bacteria cause ill health, can we fix health problems, including both gut problems and brain problems, by manipulating bacteria? So again, you will see on the internet large numbers of ads for these sorts of things, people plugging products that are supposed to improve your gut health. And the most usual thing you will find is there are ads for probiotics. That is, preparations of bacteria which are designed to manipulate the bacteria in your gut, to give you good bacteria to put into your gut to make it healthy. So this is a great idea, however, it turns out to have a limited uh, effectiveness. And it's limited in two ways. First of all, it's, it has limited effect in changing your gut microbiota. And why that is is interesting. If you create a bad environment with bad diet, no amount of shoving in good bacteria and pills in your, in your mouth is going to help, is going to fix that. Okay, so that's point one. Point two, however, it turns out that if you have a particular type of bad bacteria in your gut, they tend to hang on pretty well and it's very difficult that they colonise your gut, it's very difficult to change them. They're actually good at staying there and putting in probiotics if you have a particular type of bacteria in your gut, turns out to be not very helpful. So it really, it could be that the people who most need probiotics are the ones that are resistant to being helped by them. And when you, so there are lots of studies which have now looked at uh, probiotics and their effects on mental health. And in general, the results of those studies are eh, underwhelming. There have been so many of them now that people have done meta-analyses. And now people are talking about reviewing and putting together all the meta-analyses. That is, they've looked at all the studies Somebody's looked at these studies, somebody's looked at these studies, and so we're, we're past meta-analysis, we're meta meta-analysis, if, if you know what that means. Um, and if you think about it, we, we don't have the right tools to do these studies. If the probiotics aren't changing your gut bacteria in every individual, 
then how are you going to test whether they are good at fixing mental health disorders? Okay, so we've got a problem here. We need to be better at changing, manipulating the bacteria in the gut before, uh, for this to work. So people have suggested that maybe we should be taking supplements which, give, which don't actually give us bacteria but actually feed the bacteria in our large intestines. And the, this we call prebiotics, that is taking, eating fibre. So there are two types of prebiotics. There are, there are foods that people suggest you should eat, and they're probably the best thing to take. And then there are supplements, which are sort of uh, refined products, which are, again, are another product which, which really doesn't, doesn't uh, substitute for a, a healthy diet. Okay? So taking a supplement is not going to provide the range of different things that you require to, give, to have a healthy, uh, healthy gut. But we really don't know yet how effective those prebiotics are in fixing bad bacteria in people that really have uh, infections of, or, or predominance of bacteria which are bad for their health. So there's still work to be done there. One area which is gaining a lot of traction at the moment are these faecal transplants. The idea that you can take faeces from someone who has a healthy gut and put it into someone who has an unhealthy gut and that you will uh, normalise their bacteria. So this is a rather icky sort of concept. It's also rather expensive, difficult um, and time consuming. So first of all, in most of these studies, people will be given antibiotics to try and kill off the gut bacteria and then they will have an, an enema or some other method by which uh, the, the, the donor faeces is injected into the bowel. So these again show variable success, but they do show promise in, particularly in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. We need to, we need more research to better define what makes a good gut transplant, what makes a good uh, donor, so this, these efforts are ongoing, but they show promise and therefore people are continuing with them. And uh, I've, I've, you know, the, the, it is the latest research coming out does look good. The problem is that the good bacteria in your gut are actually very fragile. So the bad bacteria hang on for dear life and the good bacteria, what we call commensals, are they don't live for very long outside your body. So again, we need to perfect these gut uh, fecal transplants to improve the levels of these good bacteria. And that's work that's ongoing. So in conclusion, bad bacteria are hard to shift. Prevention is going to be a lot better than cure. So we need to establish good, healthy dietary habits early in life. And that's going to be really important for prevention of these sorts of diseases later on. Given the problems we have with Western diets currently and the, you know, basically the increase, the decrease in fresh foods that people are eating, the increase in, in uh, refined sugars, the increase in refined food products, we're going to have a problem in the future if we're not careful. So in summary now, do gut bacteria affect your brain? The answer is definitely yes. We know that in very specific cases how important gut bacteria are in causing mental health problems or contributing to them is hard to address in humans when we have, we're currently very bad at manipulating gut bacteria, but these things are improving. One approach is to stimulate the nerves that might inhibit inflammation. We're doing that in people with inflammatory bowel disease. It's going to be quite fascinating in those people to see what happens to the symptoms of PTSD that, the, that a large proportion of them show. And so we're, this, is, this is potentially a good side effect of that treatment and may help us to understand the mechanisms of PTSD as well, we hope, but that's not the, the, the rationale for the study. So prevention diet is the most effective way to improve gut health on a population basis. We know that because these bad bacteria are hard to move and it would be wise if uh, you have a manager to make sure they're getting, getting enough fibre in their diet. 
Because if they're making decisions based on what their gut is telling them, you better hope that it's not telling them that uh, they, they, sh they should have eaten more fibre. Okay? Just finished with one last plug. This, uh, this gut feelings uh, exhibition is uh, quite amazing. These images here don't do it nearly do it justice. It's a very interactional thing. And I'm just hoping that I can get my kids along to it and convince them how important it is for them to eat their vegetables. <laughs> so please go along and, and support the efforts, but it is certainly a lot of fun to go to.